So our third and last speaker for this symposium is Dr. Andrew Duchowski. Dr. Duchowski is a professor of visual computing at Clemson University, he maintains the ICU, the Clemson's eye tracking laboratory. His research and teaching interests include visual attention and perception, eye tracking, computer vision, and computer graphics. And the title of his talk today is Contextualizing the Everyday World Through Gaze. Just in a moment to switch. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, conference. Looks fantastic. Um, I'm going to learn a lot here. I am learning already, which is great. Um, I may have kind of blown my uh, my talk a little bit. Uh, usually, I try to know my audience, but this being the first conference of its kind, I didn't know the audience. So <laughs> I kind of took a stab at uh, focusing on the everyday world as opposed to focusing on eye tracking and eye movement analysis. So, uh, but I'm here all day and all day tomorrow. So you can ask me and maybe next year, I'll come back and do some more eye tracking analysis. So what you'll see here is me looking at how do we get at the everyday world. So what I ended up doing for this talk was um, really planning or not planning, but concentrating on the scene segmentation that's required for making sense of the everyday world onto which we map eye movement data. So you'll see eye movements here in, uh, in every aspect of it. But at the moment, I was just focused on how to segment the scene. Can I go? Okay. So I also split it into uh, four kind of sections. Uh, and really what scene segmentation is all about is how do we map the eye movement data that we collect with our eye tracker onto the objects of interest, faces of interest, or areas of interest that we call um, AOIs in our line of work. So I'm going to bring you through a sort of quite a small chronological history of how things worked, what's easy, what's hard, and uh, I'll, I will end with state of the art <laughs> incidentally uh, on that point the eye contact problem has not been solved in teleconferencing systems all the way back to 1999 when i first saw a talk on it at, at uh, sigkai so that's still a problem meanwhile looking at faces uh, you have the uncanny valley problem so i would love to do avatar experiments with eye tracking in VR and AR. Um, but one of the key experiments there is comparing uh, real faces towards avatar faces. Even the avatar faces are getting really good, but there are still these nuances that I think kind of sink them in the uncanny valley. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Another reason why I'm really happy to be here. Um, as a grad student at Texas A&M, my advisor was, I don't know, I wouldn't say he was a neuroscientist. I guess he was a physicist. And so one day, Bruce McCormick, I don't know if anybody, anybody of you know, know him. But he was actually instrumental in brain mapping research. And he was always trying to get funding for brain mapping research from the NIH. Uh, he had these hoods in the lab that were meant for cutting and slicing. They would call him the cutting and slicing professor. And... Uh, Anyway, they would kind of, he had, he had a tough time because he could never get the funding, but eventually he got the last laugh because he did get the NIH funding and he developed a really nice, uh, uh, I can't remember what it was actually called. It was like a, as a micros microscope, but it was a, it was, it would slice the brain of, of mice brains that he had and it would destroy the brain as, uh, as he was going, but he had really fine uh, slices that he made and then he would reconstruct in 3D uh, the, uh, uh, the brain uh, imaging from that. So at one point when I was a young grad student and I'm, I said, well, I think I might want to do eye tracking because it involves computer vision, computer graphics and psychology to a certain extent. And I was really interested to do this. And he goes, he goes, Andy, he goes, what drives eye movements? Can you tell me? And I'm like, uh, what part of the brain drives eye movements? And I said, I have no idea. He goes, well, you better go find out. So um, that's where I really kind of fell in love with neuroscience because I went to the medical library at AM 
and I found a whole bunch of books on neuroscience. It was really difficult to begin with because it's like a whole different language, right? Neuroscientists speak. So you have to learn parts of the brain, things like this, and um, everything from synapses to neurons and everything else. So I really enjoyed it. And so that's another reason why I'm happy to, to be here. All right. So I also split into four uh, segments, face detection, traditional markers. Um, you'll see why I'm trying to go sort of through chronologically to give you an idea of, from the computer science perspective, uh, what we can do to help uh, identify the real world, what's easy, what's hard, what's been around for a long time. So uh, this is the famous Viola Jones paper from 2001. It's, believe it or not, it's an early artificial intelligence paper because they trained uh, these cascaded uh, features and to get face detection. That's not the same as face tracking, um, nevertheless, it, uh, it works really nicely in OpenCV. So here we have the, uh, the face box, which is the outside yellow box. Uh, incidentally, this is a study that uh, was somewhat relevant to, to the keynote uh, because this is interaction and there are two phases. There's a listening phase and a speaking phase. And this is also related a little bit to... Um, to autism because here, Nina, this is Dr. Gehrer uh, in Tübingen. Uh, she was studying uh, psychopaths. So she took the uh, mobile eye tracker to prison, uh, put it on uh, violent offenders and wanted to know whether they avert uh, eye contact uh, in a similar manner as is hypothesized that autistic uh, participants do as well. So she came to me and she's a clinical psychologist and said, uh, can you get the eye box, right? Because here the eye box is not in a fixed position on the, on the video camera. The person's wearing their head. Sometimes they actually gesture and nod and things like that. So how do we do this? She also is, you see the heads moving, things like that. So, okay. So a little bit of background on this. Uh, open CV out of the box does the face, the outside box. And happily enough, they have little detectors for the left eye, right eye, nose and mouth, which is what she was interested in. But Here's the problem. If you just go and throw it in there, it doesn't quite work. You can see that it's really noisy uh, and gets lots of false positives. Okay, so how do you attack this problem? First, Google search, of course. And surprisingly, Google was quite good at this because this is one of the first hits that I got. Look at the proportions of the face. Artists have known this for a super long time. So uh, that actually worked quite well, but it's not really easy to cite. Uh, so, okay, so you can go back to the art uh, experts and say, is it really what they use? Yes, it is. And there are plenty of references that show you how art artists have known about the proportion of the face uh, for a long time. So you can cite these. And my first attempt at this, luckily, she was the only participant in the view. And so her face wouldn't change. But we've tried this on, on multiple faces afterwards, and it works quite well. So here... Uh, you can see the face box split into its dimensions as per the artistic guidelines, the one-fifth, one-third, two-third, and it's, I didn't move those bars at all. They're just exactly at the, at the dimensions of the box. Her face just happens to, to fit very nicely. So then after that, you get rid of false positives and, and Bob Gironco, of course, Nina says, well, I really want one eye box, so you have to worry about aligning them, et cetera, et cetera, but... There you are. And so the eye movement data that you see there um, was captured in real time. The face box itself is also real time. Uh, actually, I think the whole thing works in real time. I could demo it on the Mac in Python. So it's pretty fast. The eye movement data is also, you can process in real time to detect fixations from the raw gaze data. You see a little white dot jumping around. Uh, you have to just use uh, a derivative filter to find out where the high velocity jumps are, the saccades. Uh, and then what is in the saccade we assume is a fixation. It's a simplistic kind of analysis, but it, it's worked for 20 odd years and it's not too bad. All right, so that's the face. One of the most studied images that, that we know of, the computer vision people have been looking at for years. What about other things? In particular, things that are on a plane, coplanar objects, you can use fiducial markers. There's a whole pile of these. Um, they can plaster on displays of any kind and then do, again, computer vision techniques uh, to detect what people look at. So they put me in this plane and said, go fly. They actually, I actually had a, 
I think an EEG cap to put on my head um, up in, in Toulouse. It's a group in Toulouse. And I flew this thing. I'm not a pilot, uh, but I'm still here. So uh, actually, there was an instructor sitting to the right of me who landed the plane. But it, he did let me take off, which was quite fun. So here's what it looks like with a Toby eye tracker. And I think in this particular instance, the, the gaze dot there is, is a little too static. Um, I think it's just over filtered. So in this case, the gaze is, I'm sure, much more animated than what we see here. Nevertheless, the point is we want to look at where the markers are. What can we put the markers on? And these kinds of videos expose the limitations. So that the smaller the marker, the more difficult it is to find. But you can get these kinds of visualizations, which are very nice. This is a, a mixture between the traditional scan path uh, and the heat map. This is uh, due to Pesakovich, uh, who defended his dissertation on this topic. And so here the color code shows that if it's dark blue, a gaze is going to the bottom right. If it's red, it's going from right to left in a horizontal manner. Uh, so this is an edge bundling technique to combine an aggregate view of scan paths from multiple uh, participants. Here, I was just playing with this, try to get uh, map arbitrary areas of interest onto the, in, onto the instruments as opposed to squares, but little circles. Okay, so this also exposes another problem. You can see the Z axis there, the blue one tends to flip. And I've been fighting with this for years. Um, I don't know whether it's fixed or not. Aruko boards tend to maybe help. So I'm learning as I go along as well. What's interesting about this is the producial markers gave me a problem because, well, they're visible and they look like QR codes. And so the, the one question is, are they distracting uh, to, for example, pilots that we're interested in? So in fact, we can make these invisible. Uh, on the left, they're still in there. There they are, you just can't see them because we put a little IR blocking film on top of them. Uh, and so you have to have an IR light source on the ceiling and an IR sensitive camera and the eye tracker, which we do in the right panel. And so the eye tracker can see the uh, producial marker, no problem, but it is not visible to the human eye, which I thought was quite nice. And so we published that just recently. When we're uh, at ETRA, this is the eye tracking research applications conference. Somebody came up and said, you should patent this right away. And uh, I don't know if we have or not yet, but uh, it's pretty cool. So here's what it looks like right now. This is uh, University of Waterloo, my collaborators there. Um, so similar idea, but I, it is a bit more stable. I think uh, Diaco, the guy that, um, this is from an ad hoc eye tracker, by the way. It's, it's one that doesn't use cameras to look at the eye, but rather it sends a light beam uh, that reflects and is caught by MEMS, a microelectronic mirror system. Uh, and the benefit of that one is it's low power, plus it can run, he tells me, up to 500 hertz, which is uh, pretty amazing for a mobile eye tracker. So he also uses these Aruko boards, so we can look at the uh, instruments the pilots look at. Uh, and of course, we're interested in expert novice training assessment kinds of uh, applications. All right, so moving on from fiducial markers and planar objects, what about bodies as opposed to faces. How does that work? So I've been actually, uh, again, with Nina and Tubing, and I've been working on this. This is one of those situations where you have data that sits there for six years and literally nothing happens because I, I just couldn't get it to work. Um, media pipe is fairly new. That's sort of in the middle. Uh, that works pretty much in real time. It'll run off your webcam, but it just gives you the joint and uh, bones model. Uh, same with uh, over on the right, oh, so on the left, the uh, skeleton and bone, skeleton and joint uh, model that you get from OpenCV. Um, that one isn't real time. And the problem is, of course, you can't really get uh, the body part or the area that we're, that we're interested in. So the body shape is in, information is missing. And so we're at the uh, winter school night tracking in Zurich in January. And I mentioned this problem and the guy from People Labs jumps up and says, we have this solved now. I'm like, oh yeah. Um, and they do. And so it, it's based on Detectron 2 is a really interesting uh, computer uh, vision type of uh, machine learning model. It's been pre-trained for human body pose estimation. However, um, 
this is one of those things. I really liked it because I saw the demo, but then some assembly is required because I had to pull apart my old Mac from 2012, uh, put a graphics card in it that had sufficient GPUs in there and then put on Linux because people labs code uh, would run well on Linux, but I don't think it'll run on Windows. It'll run on the Mac, but then the Mac, I couldn't get to work with PyTorch, et cetera, et cetera. So here's what it looks like though, just to give you an idea. Again, it's not real time, but it will process. Oh, I don't know. Nina, of course, sends me uh, 50 videos, two minutes long, took three straight days to, to, to process. But I mean, the results are quite good because if you see at the bottom, it's really hard to tell, but oh, no, you can see on this projector, we are getting the body parts that are being hit by gaze. And so you can do some kind of statistical uh, analysis on this later. The data is again sitting there because Nina is busy with other projects, but we have this data crunched and I really want to get something published out of this. It's been sitting there for six years. Uh, but I think it's quite exciting stuff. Um, so this is why I kind of focused on the everyday world and processing, because to me, this is, uh, this is really uh, recent and state of the art. So moving on to arbitrary objects, you can do things like YOLO and OpenCV. You can train your own. And to me, this was one of the most uh, exciting things I saw recently. This is uh, Felix Wang at ETH Zurich. Uh, just finished his PhD and defended, uh, what, a couple of months ago. Uh, so if I could just go back to this and play this again, one problem with this is that even though they've drawn the gaze dot as a circle, right, it's still a point. And so here we have the point in polygon problem, essentially. So we know whether the gaze is sitting in the torso or on the arm or whatever, but so what, right? So what Felix is saying, well, the gaze point, your, your vision isn't limited to a point. It's, it's, it's got peripheral tension, peripheral preview. Um, and so it's more like a visual span. How do we get at that? How do we get metrics that, that bring that into play? So here he's combining um, something that he developed, something called the object gaze distance, where he gets the distance from the gaze point to the area of the object, not just whether it's in there. Uh, and so this is kind of what it looks like. And intentionally on the right, he's put the gaze dot between two objects, right? Because normally you'd get a no hit situation there. But if you multiply by the fixation duration versus the area of the object, you get this visual attention index that he developed. And so here on the bottom left, you can see that the gaze is, or the tension as he's modeling it, uh, is falling largely on the OOI. It's not a zero one, it's a object of interest to, that's where the uh, visual attention is falling uh, according to his model. So here's what it looks like. This is a, uh, a sort of a insulin injection practice task. And if, and if we play this, and I asked him to animate this, and this is what, what won him the uh, best paper award at EDFIS. Um, if you animate this, you can see uh, where attention is falling and also where it's decaying from other uh, regions that were just uh, looked at in the past. So here he, he had to also build the computer vision model to recognize all these objects that are there. But that wasn't too bad because it's kind of a, it's a controlled experiment here because there are only few objects, so it's not too bad. But eventually I think that of course, this is a pretty good idea to, uh, to develop further and, uh, and build on. In the real world where you are using eye trackers, usually mobile or whatnot. All right, so to summarize, um, I just gave you a glimpse of how to process the real world uh, visually so that we can, we can get some kind of gaze-based metrics on them. I didn't tell you a lot about gaze-based metrics. That's, that's where I fell short in this talk due to time constraints. Maybe next year I can give you a talk on, uh, on metrics. But there, that's the other side of the equation is what do we do with these besides something like this? I mean, numerically, how do I compare these? I don't quite know yet. Um, there are transition matrix diagrams, hidden Markov models, things of that sort, um, ambient focal attention indices that we have. 
Um, but that's a topic for a future talk. All right, so I'm currently interested in expert novice assessment training applications of these. And of course, as you know, eye movements are task dependent. So I think the task that you pick and the protocols that you choose uh, will of course be uh, very important as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for that <clears throat> very nice talk. I have one question which is related to discussions that David and I and others in the group had, you know, years back where we thought about this potent, you know, this how to label, uh, well, whatever we get from an eye tracker. Um, and then we were looking into, you know, what the big companies offer as basically uh, without the eye tracking, but actually at least for scene and context analysis. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of YouTube and, you know, all those, those companies that basically have tons of video without the eye tracking but try to make sense of what's in the video and uh classify it and so on and so the, the short question here is do, are you aware of any <clears throat> accessible maybe even open source solutions beyond you know, like open cv and so that you know google and all those big companies probably spend a lot of money on to to do their the video uh analysis uh well yeah they i mean op people labs detectron 2 all the stuff that i showed you that's all free you can get that and analyze the videos, but how do you get the videos, I guess, is the other issue. You can't download YouTube videos very easily. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but but yeah, the software that I showed you there, that's pretty much all open source. It's uh, people, I just I said pupil labs, but you can you can get it. And Detectron 2 is free as well. So that's all Python free stuff. I uh, I mainly use free stuff because I have no money. <laughs> in fact, this other reason I'm here, I'm looking forward to possibly uh, finding new collaborations and funding opportunities. Hope I answered your question. Anything else? Thank you for the really interesting talk. My, my question is a little bit like David's. It's a little bit unformed, but as cognitive visual scientists or just neuroscientists, we're really interested in what's going on in the brain mm -hmm. as we are controlling these targets. And I'm watching your, your gaze uh, uh, movies go around and the, the eye is moving here, it's moving there, it's moving wherever it goes. And the question is why and what information is being provided to the brain and how can we integrate the uh, methods that you have into methods that we have to acquire neural activity in order to bring brain and the, your visual process together. Oh uh, yeah, okay. I, in some in some ways, uh, I didn't focus in on that because we've been always working under the assumption that we're always measuring overt attention, and so that goes back to the eye mind assumption. Everything I, I'm looking at, I'm processing cognitively in some shape or form so generally speaking we're usually looking for fixations in the data and whatever you're looking at we associate with cognitive function that's that's the easiest thing i can i can say uh, what else do you do beyond that is is couched in the protocols and, and how you set up the experiments and design them so you know when you're looking at your um, joint, there are joint attention tasks. Take a look at some of the posters that are here. All right. I don't even have a good answer on, on how to, how to obtain data on what people are looking at, at the same time. But if, if we do looking at faces and eye contact, we are computing whether you're looking at eye contact versus other parts of the face. And we're assuming that the eyes are more important in some way. Uh, but how to bring them together with, with brain, it would be really nice to combine with Efners or something else. I haven't done that, any of that myself, but that'd be kind of cool to do. Uh, the big problem is synchronization, as, as with all the experiments that you've shown, and how do you get at the exact timing of it all? Uh, plus, you have to worry about different frame rates, uh, sampling rates, things of that nature. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. It was well formed. It's just that I don't know if there's a very well formed response. However, more, more yeah, to come. more to come. Absolutely. 
Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. And uh, well, everybody is very, is interested in the Toby glass, but the use of the Toby glass is really difficult because you can't fix the uh, what I say the frame. So the uh, use of the alcohol marker is really amazing and it's really uh, working great. But uh, uh, how effective is the uh, IR in the real world situation? I, IR illuminated. Uh, Arco marker is really fantastic, but then, uh, 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 well, this world is uh, 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 filled with uh, infrared. So, right. how effective is it? Excellent question. Yeah. I don't know um, because we're using that in a simulator, so we have a controlled mm -hmm. environment, right? And so, the lighting is actually pretty low in there, uh, so that you can see the displays, uh, and it's it's surrounded by, you know, monitors essentially. So it's it's all like a it's a simulator. So in the real world, I think it would be a problem because there's lots of IR in the visible spectrum. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. We haven't we haven't done that kind of experiment. Okay, Good thank question. you very much. Two things. First, just picking up on where you and Joy were talk, uh, chatting. Um, your eye, uh, your scene analysis, seeing the eyes, and you can see when somebody um, actually gazes on somebody else's eyes. That seems like a social interaction, right? So, and I could imagine just doing analyses triggered on eye contact, right? I mean, it seems like a very natural sort of everyday world. Right, 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 right. I mean, just as you're walking about in the everyday world, you could have just those eye contact type interactions would potentially be good, a good experimental paradigm. Um, and you've got the tools for it. So thank you. Yeah. Um, you kept, you were teasing us with gaze metrics. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I saw at the beginning of your talk that you speak really well without slides. So, so maybe, maybe <laughs> right. you could tell us a little bit about your, uh, sure. <laughs> what gets you excited about gaze metrics. Yeah, and I don't know how to, you know, tie it. Well, okay, Here, here's an example that'll tie to the uh, dorsal and ventral streams. Um, my good friend is uh, Christoph Kreitz uh, developed this, this metric. It's not, maybe he didn't develop exactly. He just kind of normalized it to the Z-scores. Anyway, uh, let's see how to phrase it properly. The ambient focal coefficient is what he came up with. So this is fixation duration. Um, the current fixation duration minus the subsequent saccade. Okay, if you think about this, uh, if you have a long fixation duration, a big number, and then you're a very small saccade, then you have a positive number. If you have a very short duration with a giant saccade afterwards, you have a small number minus big number, you get a negative number. So that's K is less than zero. And then you have to think, wait a minute, you're subtracting distance from time. How do you do that? So that's where Kreitz comes in. Uh, because he said that if you take the z-scores, so take the k minus the mean divided by standard deviation, the z-scores, one z-score minus another z-score is okay. He assured me of this. He's a statistic, statistician, our biostatistician, NIH said, who's your biostatistician? Him. So, um, so that's one example. And, but that's been around for a while because ambient focal, um, usually when you're looking at scene perception, you go to an art gallery or, or whatever, you see it and previously unseen image, you're going to be uh, ambient to get the sort of feel of where you're looking, right? So that's, uh, which one is it? Is that the dorsal stream? Um, this is the what of vision, right? No, sorry, that's the where, the ambient stream. <laughs> Once you get focal, now you're doing the what stream. So I, I always get confused which one's which, but the what and where are loosely tied to the ventral dorsal streams. Um, but that's been around for a while because that's also skimming and scrutinizing. And there were other terms for this kind of eye movement and behavior. So that's one form of metric. The next one I'm really excited about is, is um, transition matrices. So for example, looking at the face, here we've got a, a finite number of, of areas of interest. We have the eyes, actually left eye, right eye, nose, mouth, right? So if you, if you draw that, that's one, two, three, four. Four source regions versus four destination regions. You got a little four by four matrix. Now, based on the observations that you make, if I'm going, I'm looking at the left eye, the next eye movement I made goes to the right eye. That's one transition over some period of time that you have to define experimentally. Um, so with that, you have observed 
uh, probabilities of where I went to. And it's usually on a diagonal because you tend to refixate the same objects. So you get this nice transition matrix. And then I asked Kreitz, I said, well, that's great. When I'm looking at faces, uh, whether we're looking at emotions, detecting emotions, right? And, and I can use that term because Nina is the psychologist. And so she, she assures me that uh, we had seven emotions. So looking at or trying to identify which emotion the person is expressing, we can compute these transition matrices. And then I said, okay, that's great. How do I compare these things to get my p-value? Great says, well, you can take the entropy. That's just one number per matrix. Oh, great. So that's another kind of metric that I'm really excited about. And the next thing though is for, for where we're going forward, the, the real future of this, I think is, and we've all been talking about is dynamics, right? Because we can all look at still images, but what happens when you're moving around and looking at eye movement data in time? And so if you take these transition matrices, chop them up, with some kind of time window, you can animate these things. Uh, transition matrix will give you, the dual is a transition graph. And so you can animate that and it looks really cool. I, I don't have a paper written on this yet, but my colleagues at Waterloo have showed me this and it's, it's amazing stuff. And then they also said on top of that, they said, well, if you can do this, you know, we've got the six pack flight instruments, right? We got the vertical speed indicator, altitude, uh, turn, turn rate heading six instruments. So again, six by six uh, transition matrix. Well, they said we can, we can do the observed probability. So these are our known or observed states. What about putting on a hidden Markov model on top of this? To which I said, what's a hidden Markov model? Oh, well, these are hidden states that you assume the person is doing, right? based on whatever you, you hypothesize the brain is doing at the time. So the pilot could be maintaining horizontal speed, could be maintaining vertical speed, or could be doing something else. So those three states are now mapped to the transition matrices. Um, and we'll, we can, we'll see what happens from there. I haven't worked that out yet, or we haven't obtained data to get it, but that's the next kind of stage that we're looking at. So those are two of the, the things that I really like, ambient focal, uh, transition matrices, and everything's dynamic. Can you do it in real time is a key issue for us. And then you can map those kinds of metrics to what you're hypoth hypothesizing as happening in the brain. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs>